Why hello there dear gamers! Today we're going to be playing Max Payne, one of my most favorite games from my childhood. It's very nostalgic for me. And I did want to talk about not only what Max Payne is all about, but also dive into how the art style works, the aesthetics, what the game was trying to kind of say and convey, all for the upcoming remake that Rockstar Games is making. Now, when it comes to Max Payne, the first one is the best by far. Second one, not too bad. And the third one completely deviated from the entire narrative. And so, since the third one was made by Rockstar Games, and since it's a more recent one, I do kind of want to show how they could mess up in the remake, and how they should actually try to make the remake, or reboot, or whatever it's trying to be. I think it's supposed to be a remaster, if anything, but they're going to try to remake it. It's not going to be the same thing. It's going to be crappy. Crappy, at least, to my opinion, because every time these companies come out with some kind of remake or reboot, they never come out well, unless it's something very simple like Doom. Like, Doom came out perfectly fine. Max Payne, on the other hand, I don't expect it to come out fine at all. I think it's going to be more like how Silent Hill had a remake with... I think it was called F Frozen Memories? Uh, but either way, I'm going to play throughout the game. I am going to try to do the game on the easier level, just so that I know I can beat it because I've beaten the easier level. I never really tried the harder levels. Maybe if I wanted to really challenge myself or if people really want to see me struggle, I'll do the harder difficulties, but that's like probably on request only. It's going to be a simple playthrough and I'm going to be explaining every single theme, every single symbol, everything that I can to explain why the game is the way it is and why people really enjoyed it over the other games. So. I'll be saying a lot of terrible things about Max Payne 3, of course, because that was... Oh jeez, that one was the worst one. <laughs> I don't even want to consider it a Max Payne game at this point. So, let's start it up. Oh, and I do want to mention, this is on PC, as you can see from the mouse pointer. This is the Steam version. So, there is a problem with this game when it comes to computer. Your character... Well, if you buy the game... I'm not saying you should, I'm not saying you shouldn't, I'm just saying if you do, there will be a lot of problems. It doesn't come with sound, of all things. There is no sound if you buy the game on the Steam version, because the sound doesn't, like, it's not there. I don't know why, but it's not there. And so you do have to modify it, you have to look for patches, and those you can find online, just say, hey, just type into Google, Max Payne no sound, Max Payne fix. Um, Max Payne stuck to ground, <laughs> stuck to walls, because that's what happens in the game if you don't patch it. You're gonna get stuck to walls and there's no sound. It's the biggest mess possible. And that's simply because games from olden days, ye olden games, they don't play well on modern operating systems. So I have Windows 10, unfortunately. This game's all messed up because of it. So you have to patch it, and even with patching, it still doesn't work for a lot of things. There's nightmare levels that become a bigger nightmare later on. And those are just, you're stuck to the ground and you can't jump and it's a platforming area. So you have to platform and you can't jump. So I do have a couple of saves that are like a little bit past that area. So if you do see anything later on in the game where I like cut forward or something, it's because I was literally stuck to the ground. I tried as much as I can do. I can't do anything else for it. So, uh, with that said, let's go on to the game. Oh, and during cutscenes, I'm gonna try not to talk, but I will talk a lot during the during the comic book scenes. Standby, 1010. Investigative reported disturbance at Acer Plaza. 104 dispatcher, verify address. It's Acer Plaza. Repeat, Acer Plaza. Shots fired on the rooftop. An assault in progress at Acer Plaza. This kind of opening has a lot of inciting incidents. And it is in medias res, meaning it's telling us the story in the middle of the story, and that's gonna go back to the beginning. Please 
repeat. 10-5, all units, all units, emergency. Officer in danger, Acer Plaza, repeat. Acer Plaza, all units. They were all dead. The final gunshot was an exclamation mark to everything that had led to this point. I released my finger from the trigger, and then it was over. To make any kind of sense of it, I need to go back three years. Back to the night the pain started. Alright, I'm going to pause it there, just because already we have so much going on. So, as we saw, we have Max, who's up on top of a giant tower, and he has a gun in his hand. And there's police coming towards him, saying that shots are fired. And then he says that he releases his finger from the trigger, and then it was all over. All of this is very vague. We don't know what he actually did, but we are curious as to who he shot, why he did it. I mean, it's a sniper rifle on top of a giant building. There's so many possibilities. Granted, if you do play the game and you get to the final mission and everything, the sniper rifle actually is a bit of a red herring because you don't really use a sniper rifle, you use a grenade launcher, but that's skipping ahead. So far we have a great amount of noir elements. This opens beautifully with noir elements. We have police, we have crime, we have a lot of strange angles, and we have darkness. It starts in the night, continues on through the night. The only time there is daylight is going to be a little bit later, but it's nighttime, snow, and then we have um, him saying to make any kind of sense of it, I need to go back three years. So he's saying, all right, this is in the middle. I'm going to go backwards. And then it shows part one, American Dream. So it's going to introduce us to what was his dream. What was something that he found that was beautiful in his life. Or it can be making it sarcastic. I was still in the force back then. NYPD, Manhattan, Midtown North Precinct, Hell's Kitchen. So when are you coming to work for me, Detective Payne? You'd make me work undercover in some hellhole. Sorry, Alex. Shell and the baby come first. See? My last smoke. It's bad for the baby. That's you, Max. A regular Boy Scout. See you, Alex. Still on for poker Thursday night, right? Like taking candy from a baby. Alright, so in this first part, he says that he was still in the force. So already you know that he left the force. That he used to be a cop. And this is great because we have a person who goes from being a cop to being a fugitive. That's what noir is mostly all about. They start off in this lifestyle that is ethically pleasing. But then later on, they had to enter this underworld that is aesthetically pleasing. Something that is of the result of the absurd world that he's in. You know, something tragic happens. And this kind of hints at all the tragedy right away. Where we have his friend Alex. Okay, this is his friend in the force. And then he says that he has a wife, Michelle. Yeah, so right now, Max Payne is living like Obama. He's at the top. He cannot go down. And he has a baby. So his wife and child. And these come first. Right? The first and foremost. That's what he tells everybody. And that means that these are the most important things to his life before anything else. So really, really quickly, he just tells everybody, look, this is what I care about. And I hope they don't get taken away. And then lo and behold, we're going to see that the tragedy that comes from his life is where the things that he cares most about are taken away. These are the ethically pleasing elements of his life. Rather than the aesthetically pleasing, it's ethically pleasing. And I'm telling you this because all of this revolves around what is called Christian existentialism. And I know this is going to be a really weird thing to say when we're talking about a game that's full of like Norse mythology and all that other stuff, but a big chunk of this story is based off of uh, things like Kierkegaard and possibly other kinds of existentialists. Maybe a little bit of Nietzsche here and there. But all of this is derived from noir films of the 1930s to 40s. And all of these stories were existential crises. A person has the world challenge them, has the world take them on and say, you're not allowed to be happy. So they lose all meaning, they lose all purpose, they lose their life, and then they have to figure out how do I have a life when my life before is gone? And so that's why this game is so impressive. He has a life before, now it's gone. What does he do? And that's when he takes revenge on whoever killed his family. And, you know, he, he used to smoke, and then he's like, oh no, I'm not gonna smoke anymore. 
So let's carry on with this. Life was good. Sun setting on a sweet summer's day. The smell of freshly mowed lawns. The sounds of children playing. A house across the river on the Jersey side. A beautiful wife and a baby girl. The American dream come true. Honey, I'm home. The dreams have a nasty habit of going bad. You're not looking. So he had a great life. And it says the sun was setting. A sun setting means that night is coming. The light of the world is receding the second that he has his family die. So when he has his family die, it's sunset. And he says that he has the American dream come true. So when they're talking about the American dream, this is from a long time ago. What the American dream was all about was where you would have a an average family with a car, a suburban house, and this was kind of like what people wanted from other countries. So the American dream is a bit of a play on words because here he has an American dream become a nightmare thanks to American elements that is later on to be determined as crime, uh, organized mafias, and corporations, which all intertwine with each other because in this game there's also like a military aspect to it. So a lot of things that make America, America, make it into a dream and also a nightmare. And that's kind of what this game revolves around is that the country itself, the way that these things work, uh, the authorities and the, the government, the establishment, all these things fail us in due time. Not, not in general, just this specific one, America. This is not an anti-American sentiment. This is just them saying that there are bad things that are in America, and the American dream is true, but only to, I guess, certain people, or as long as you don't reveal the, the underbelly, the shadow of America. So America is a bit like a person in this case, because it does have an id, an ego, a shadow, all these like psychological things. And then so the shadow of America comes in to ruin his life. And that's what he means by dreams have a nasty habit of going bad when you're not looking. You're not paying attention, the shadow comes in and ruins your life. And that's when the shadow overwhelms you. And it can even be something like an anima or animus. This is all Jungian stuff, but the animus is for if you're a woman, your animus takes over and then you start becoming like this like corporate girl boss that wants to control everything and you roll things with an iron fist. And then if it's a man, their anima takes over and they become a very weak timid like stepping stool like a like a floor mat because they just have no spine anymore they're completely worthless so it's interesting to show that this story does have a bit of union in it and it does have a freudian from from typical noir flicks from the 1930s and 40s so that all this psychological stuff that kind of revolves around this setting it is great and it's something that people should admire for what it's trying to do because this comes in right away in the beginning, and we're getting it without even blinking an eye. It's said so flawlessly in only a couple of sentences, but we get it. When I'm explaining to you, we get it right away. Let's keep on. Let's just keep on going. This is great. He's gonna get a show, and he doesn't like it. So his entire life feels like it's playing out. In a, in a theatrical kind of way. Oh, and here's our first clue. Also, here's his jacket. Later on, he wears it. Okay, so this is actually really great. When he says something ugly has been tattooed on the wall, the way that he says tattooed shows that the house itself is a bit like a person. I think that's called... I forgot the term for that one. Personification? I think it's called personification, but how this works in something that's noir is that the world around the main character, the one who's monologuing everything, this world is not a world outside of their head. It is a world in their head. And that doesn't mean that you're supposed to see everything like a dream or like a, some kind of psychotic, schizophrenic hallucination it's more where the the writer the author of the story 
they're trying to portray the entire world around this main character as symbolic representations of their inner emotions, feelings, and expression. And this is where German Expressionism comes from in noir. German Expressionism was a big part of noir. And there was also another aspect called Poetic Realism, which kind of is in this story because your main character is like an average Joe who's living the American dream, and that is poetic, and that is realistic. He's not some big, huge character. He's just some or average guy who becomes bigger as he goes along. And the way that he fights is where he has like this gun fu, and that is poetic. That's like this fantasy kind of thing coming in. And, you know, whether or not it is possible for him to do these kinds of things, or think in the way that he is when he's doing this gun fu bullet time, uh, that doesn't really matter because the world itself already is part of his mind, so maybe he can slow down time, maybe he can't, depends. But later on in the game, at least in the second and third game, they kind of put this into the world and determine that it is real. And so that's when it, it kind of goes from being poetic realism to just being some kind of surrealism. I will explain a little bit of that later on as I can find things to kind of relate it to because I don't want to start deviating already. Let's start. <laughs> we just started. But this V right here on the wall, map of things to come, it shows a V with a syringe and throughout the entire game we have this, this drug called Valkyr that is induced with a syringe. It's injected. And so whoever put this up on the wall is either a junkie or somebody who is promoting this drug. And later on we find out all about this. So it's a great thing to start off with. Put the tattoo on the wall right away of the, the drug that revolves around the whole story. Great, wonderful, don't remove this. If the remake removes this aspect, I don't think it's a good remake. I, at least the opening wouldn't be as good. This is amazing to start off with. And then when he says a magic tag full of diabolical meanings, he's not being fallacious. This drug here is magical. It's a hallucinogen. It sends you into your nightmares. So when he says magic tag, it's no different than saying something like the magic tags from uh, Japanese and Chinese mythology. There are these magic tags. I forgot what they're called. It depends on the country, but you'll put a magic tag on a zombie. The zombie will obey whatever you're doing. In China, they don't call them zombies, they call them vampires, but they have a different name, uh, Zhengxi. They call them Zhengxi. And with these Zhengxi, they, they obey the owner of whoever tags them. So it's a poison syringe, a magic tag, full of diabolical meanings. It's pretty much saying whoever owns this drug is controlling these vampires, these zombies. And that right there, that's great, wonderful symbolism. Even if you don't understand what the magic tag means. And also, when you say tag, it's an other term for graffiti. Tagging the thing. So, it has all these multiple meanings. That kind of poetic representation and symbolism is much welcomed. We get sucked into this idea. Even if we don't understand or even if we didn't know about the whole Chinese thing, it doesn't matter. Still, it still sounds wonderful either way. Whether you're looking at it symbolically in like a supernatural sense, or you're looking at it symbolically in like a colloquial, cultural sense, it works either way. And that's what we want with metaphors like this. This is how noir metaphors work wonderfully. And this is why the entire script of the game, the first game at least, is well-renowned as an amazing script because it has so many different meanings that can mean all, and they're all correct. There's no wrong meaning with this symbolism. They're both correct. Let's keep on going. Alright, see? You have flashes all across the room. Pulls out his gun already. And the phone's ringing. Broken mirrors, blood on the walls. Listen, someone's broken into my house. Call 911. Is this the pain residence? Yes, someone's broken into my house. They're still here. You have to... God. I'm afraid I cannot help you. Who is this? Hello? So this one's kind of weird. I don't know why, but they had the main villain call the house, and 
he says someone's broken in the house, they're still here, you have to help me. Instead of just calling the police himself. <laughs> I don't know why he doesn't just call the police himself. But the main villain of the story is this woman, Nicole Horn. And she says, I'm afraid I cannot help you. And then it's just like, oh, who is this then? <laughs> this one is to allude to who the main villain is, and I'm not sure why she calls him. This one could be taken out, maybe, in the remake. It doesn't matter too much. It's just to say, oh, this is the villain calling the house while the crime is going on. And she's the one who sent the killers. As you can see, I'm struggling trying to go up these stairs. Michelle! No! 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 <laughs> Michelle! Please! Freeze! NYPD, drop it! This is Obama, get down! baby's dead. Alright, I kind of just lowered the volume of the music just because of how crazy loud it was. Hug me. These blocks coming later on. Very peaceful music. His innocence has been killed. Peace has been shattered. Ooh. Background of the walls look really nice. I almost never get shot by this guy. This time I did get hit in the toe. No, oh, God, no, please, Michelle. Right, this, this is why the oh, door didn't baby. open. And he sees his wife laying in the bed, arms stretched out, a little bit like Jesus. But since the woman, we would have to consider her a bit more like Mary. That was three years ago. Everything ripped apart in a New York minute. The killer junkies had been high on a previously unknown designer drug, Valkyr, V. After the funeral, I told Alex I'd be transferring to the DEA. That opening, it's heart-wrenching. His entire life is ruined before his very eyes. He comes home from work, normal day, it's sunset, and then he has to find his wife and child killed in front of him, pretty much. He sees the killers there, and if you notice, the killers were wearing these kind of aqua blue, aqua green, whatever, jumpsuits. They didn't look like normal people, they looked like they came out of some kind of mental institution. So, the story in the beginning kind of wants you to think that these are just crazy people. Literal inmates from a crazy asylum who came in to kill his wife and child. That's how it's supposed to feel. And that's kind of how the representation goes, is that these were just crazy people who killed his family. Literally showing them in the uniform of a crazy person. All right, I don't mean like they're crazy because they're screaming around and stuff. They're wearing the uniform of a crazy person. But later on, we do find out that these people weren't necessarily crazy. They were on drugs and they were sent by the person who called on the phone. And the person wanted the wife and child killed because of a certain reason that we find out later on. But this entire opening, whether you know the ending or not, it's engaging. It sucks you in so well. I love the opening. Because not only is it more easy than the, the rest of the game, the rest of the games are much harder. I make it look easy and I still got shot even though I'm doing this so many times. Oh, so his whole life is ripped before his very eyes. This is a traumatizing thing to happen. This is what the whole no thing was about. You know, the Darth Vader style, no, you know, that whole thing. That's an amazing moment because this is the moment where he's holding his dead wife in his hands in his bedroom of all places, right in his very home. The home in psychology, it's more like your inner mind where you feel safe. This is like the comfort area. This is your shelter where you feel the most safe. And in his mind, he has his, his child, his legacy, pretty much, his biological legacy. 
his effort of all he's done in his life to come down to this moment of having a baby. And the baby is the product of your entire life going well ethically, right? You have a child, you reproduce, and then if the child grows up well, you have a decent legacy. You, you did something well, and then you carry on all your legacy into this child. That's dead. There is no legacy now. His wife, the one that he tried so hard to get in the first place and then worked to marry, and now that's gone too. His house doesn't mean anything anymore. His house is meaningless. It's a dead zone. It's where they're killed. So now he can't even go to his own house because all there is is just the memories of his family dying in the house. We don't feel this right away, but this kind of moment is heart-wrenching. We feel his emotion maybe later on. We, we, we probably get used to it as we play the game if we're kind of disconnected. But symbolically, this sticks with us throughout the entire game. We cannot remove this from our mind. Every time we see Max killing somebody, every time he says, I'm going to kill the people who kill my family, or any time somebody that he likes dies, we can't remove this from our mind. It's always going to be their family dead, right? And this is why, his, like, what does he do with his life at this point? Well, three years later, he goes on a killing spree. He plans to kill people who killed his family. Um, but here it says the three years ago, everything ripped apart in New York Minute. New York Minute is an amazing way to say it because he is from Jersey. New York Minute is just an informal way in America to say something happened very quickly. And it actually is more or less an, a, a term that came from Texas of all places because Texans would say that New Yorkers can do so much in what a Texan can, can do in a minute. Like, a Texan would be slower because there's so much time in the world for the Texan. But in New York, you're like, got to go really crazy and fast because New York is a really hustle and bustle kind of way. Um, and then it says the killer junkies have been a high on a previously unknown designer drug, Valkyr, or also called V. That's the symbol that you saw on the wall. And after the funeral, he told Alex, his friend, that he would be transferring to DEA. So he became a drug enforcer rather than, I think he was a detective. I think previously he was, he was either like a normal cop or he was a detective or something. Now he's working against drugs. Now he's pretty much like uh, that fat guy in Breaking Bad. It took us three long years to get a break in the Valkyr case. Then finally, two months ago, a dime dropper tipped us off that Jack Lupino, a mob boss in the Punchinello crime family, was trafficking. I went undercover infiltrated the worst mafia family in New York. All right, so they had a break in the case. So they took three years just to get a break in the case of his family dying. And then, apparently, somebody called Jack Lapino was trafficking. Trafficking the drug. So they find out that a guy called Jack Lapino from a dime dropper, aka a snitch, tells them that Jack Lapino is trafficking the drug that they're after. Okay, well... There's kind of like a coldness here. And then, amazingly, I love this part in the story. It has three panels separated, but then they're all sort of together. And it has Max merged with this city. Max and the city are one and the same. It's not just New Jersey. It's not just, you know, whatever we can consider as New York. This is Noir York City, which later on is in a TV show that some guy is, um... And it's kind of like Twilight Zone kind of thing. And he calls it Noir York City. Max is not in New Jersey anymore. He's in what is, in his mind, Noir York City. The TV show in the game and also his mind get combined. And this is why he is merged with the city. The city and him are one and the same. And the city is his shadow. It's everything that he hates about himself. Or everything that he doesn't want to show to the world. This is the underworld, all right? And so he goes undercover to infiltrate the worst mafia family in New York. He tries to pretend he's not himself to go and search inside his shadow, inside the underworld of his mind. 